this is Judge Judah, the show where we pit science and religion against each other in a court of law. I am your host, Judge Judah, the brother of Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Judge Judah Show. As you probably know, the plaintiff is the guy who is making the positive claim. And today, that's Dr. Donald Prothro, a paleontologist and geologist at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. The defendant is the guy, or gal, who is representing the default or null position. And today, that will be Wendy Wright, a conservative American Christian activist and fervent biblical creationism believer. Mr. Prothro here claims that there is ample evidence of evolution in the fossil record. This Wendy chick says that's a bunch of crap or whatever. All right, Mr. Prothro, what is your problem? What stimulated this whole thing to begin with was years and years of battling creationists who had never in their life seen a real fossil and could not tell one bone from another and were pretending to talk about fossils and they couldn't even tell if the slide was upside down or right side up or not, okay? <laughs> All right, what else? Again and again, it was obvious to me they are just reading from a script. They would have no idea what their slides actually show because they have no first-hand experience. And yet, it's very common in the creationist uh, community to pretend that they are paleontologists, to pretend that they know what they're doing. All right, uh, that's not really what we're here for today, but whatever. Miss Wright, what's your problem? There is no evidence of evolution from going from one species to another species. If that, if evolution had occurred, surely there'd be at least one a evidence. Yeah, well, that is true. There should be at least one evidence, Mr. Prothero. What do you got, eh? Going all the way from the simplest life, amoeba-like creatures which have simple bubble-like shells, nothing's missing. The whole sequence of transformation from something shaped like a big sponge all the way to these funny things that have all sorts of caps and spines on them. You can see every one of the in intermediate forms in that entire sequence, okay? Or things that are familiar to most of us who collect fossils, from trilobites to mollusks, like these are actually from the Texas Gulf Coastal Plain, to uh, horseshoe crabs. There's lots and lots of evolutionary sequences. Or how about something that's a transition between the jointed legged animals like insects and spiders and scorpions and crustaceans, the arthropods. We have these soft bodied creatures called onychophorans. Uh, well, even here, we have an amazing sequence of our closest relatives, which, believe it or not, among all the animals not related to us, Closely, the closest is sea, sea stars and sea urchins and things like that. Those are actually our closest relatives, the echinoderms. And we can see in the fossil record how we make that transition from them to these very primitive relatives of the chordates, which are very primitive fish-like creatures. And then, only about 10, 15 years ago then, they started finding these amazing soft body fish in China, which are, don't have any bone yet, but they're beautifully preserved. And they are clearly much more advanced than anything that we've seen uh, prior to that. And when you put them all together in a diagram like this, you can see there's, where do you draw the line? Okay, here's something everyone agrees is a fish. Here's something everyone agrees is a worm. Okay, and there's a lancelet, and then there's some of these fossil forms, these very early fish, which are extremely primitive. Right, it's a cont continuous sequence there. You couldn't ask for a nicer transition. Show me the evidence of uh, the in-between stage from one species to another. For example, this family tree here, here are things that everyone agrees are fish and then a whole series of more and more advanced aquatic amphibians until you get to things everyone agrees are amphibians, like frogs, right? Where do you draw a line? There isn't any, right? It's a continuous sequence. This is what's often nicknamed the frogamander, Garabotragus hotni. It has a body like a salamander, head like a frog. So which you call it? This is one of the earliest known amphibians, a thing called, uh, nicknamed Lizzie the Lizard, it comes from Scotland, and it shows what the earliest land animals that laid eggs probably look like. This one is one of my favorites, it was discovered about seven or eight years ago. It's a turtle that has a shell on its, on its belly, but no shell on its back. It still has ribs. And it's the last turtle in the entire history of life that still has teeth. If you look at any modern turtle, they have no teeth in their jaw. So there's a continuous sequence of these turtle-like forms going through time now. Or how about snakes? There's something that really fits the biblical motif. These are snakes from the Cretaceous. This one is from the Cretaceous of Israel, which still has its hind limbs, which are shown in that detail right there. And then they just described a few weeks ago before I gave this talk, this snake, which has four limbs. 
Now, there's lots of examples of dinosaurs in every creationist lecture attempting to uh, discredit evolution, all of which shows they know nothing about dinosaurs when they do this. Show me the evidence of uh, the in-between stage from one species to another. Triceratops right there is only one of many hundreds of different kinds of ceratopsian dinosaurs which have these big bony frills and sometimes horns on their faces and so on. And we have an excellent fossil record of how they go back to something which has the frill but no horns to back to things called Cetacosaurus which still walked on two legs and not four but had the triceratops like head and beak and back to things like uh, more primitive things like that. We have excellent fossils that show in primitive sauropods that still walked on two legs. Archaeopteryx, the first fossil bird. You know, the creationists first try to deal with this, they say, oh, well, it's just a bird because it has feathers. And they ignore every other aspect of its anatomy. Okay, it has long bony fingers. You know how many birds you know have long bony fingers today? None, right? When you have chicken wings, that little portion of the bone that's all pointy that you never eat because there's no meat on it, that's their entire hand used together. Okay, and if you've ever had chicken thighs, right, the very back of the chicken has no tail bones left anymore because they're fused together and then the uh, tail bones held by feathers, but this guy has a long dinosaurian tail and a dinosaurian ankle and teeth, which no living bird has, okay? And so without the feathers, this thing is more dinosaur than bird, and only because of feathers, creatures have to fit it in their narrow category. It's got to be a bird because it has feathers, okay? That's the way they think. And then, of course, since Archaeopteryx, especially in recent years, the number of new specimens that have come out, mostly out of China, these are all dinosaurs by everyone's description of a dinosaur. None of these things could fly. None of these things are really birds yet, and they all have beautiful, beautiful feathers. Feathers evolved long, long before flight occurred. You say, well, how can that be? But you remember, most of the feathers on a bird are not for flight, right? Most of the feathers on a bird are for insulation. So here is now a more up-to-date family tree of birds, and there's just many, many different kinds all through the latter part of the age of dinosaurs, and all of them one step more advanced than the last one. Show me the evidence of uh, the in-between stage from one species to another. Uh, this is Cynornis from China, for example. It still has a tooth beak, but does not have the long bony dinosaurian tail, and still has long fingers. And there's others which have lost the fingers and begin to fuse the hand together, but still have teeth left, so you lose these features one at a time. All right. Here's a group now closer to us. This is the transition from things that are not us, not mammals, to mammals. But they are one of the most beautifully documented sequence of fossils in the fossil record because we have an amazing number of these things which the most primitive ones are clearly reptilian in most respects, yet they're on our lineage. And then you go all the way to things that everyone agrees are a mammal by the time you get to the end of it. For example, uh, you look at these very primitive ones like the big finbacks that you get from uh, Texas here. And they have all these bones in the back part of their jaw, okay, as all reptiles do actually. And they have to reduce those bones in the back because they aren't part of the chewing motion anymore and they're actually weak in the jaw. So those bones get reduced and reduced and gradually lost until all those bones are lost except for two. So all reptiles and these guys still had that jaw hinge. But mammals have a different hinge. Your jaw hinge is made of this bone, the dentary, which is up against a different bone in the skull called the squamosal. Okay? And so it's a very amazing transition. You literally go from one to the other. And when creationists talk about this, they say, oh, how can you imagine that happening? It happened to you when you were an embryo. Your jaw bones are in your ear now, and they were in your jaw when you started developing. They're known as the hammer and the anvil, okay? The incus and the malleus, all right? Those two bones are making the vibrations on your eardrum that you're listening with right now. And they were in your jaw when you were an embryo. Okay, and they move in that process. And there's actually fossils like this one called diathognathus, which has the mammal jaw joint in operation side by side with the reptilian jaw joint. So it's switch header, you can do both. Okay, literally in the process of switching jaw joints in the while it's alive. And then let's focus on mammals. At the end of the age of dinosaurs and the early part of the age of mammals in this yellow band right here, we had a gigantic radiation. And I'm just going to take a few examples to show you how many amazing transitions we have. Show me the evidence the of going on uh, the in-between stage from one species to another. One of those, for example, is this one right here. This is Naliarctos, which comes from not far from where I live in California. It's a bear-like creature that's on its way to becoming a seal. All right. Or those of you who are John Lennon fans, this is the earliest known walrus, Proneotherium, with almost no tusks. And then you move to Gonfateria, which has upper and lower tusks. And then you go to more advanced ones like Balanictus, which has got long tusks, but not as long as the modern walrus. Again, nice sequence there. Or if you like cats, there are many branches of cats and things that are related to cats and saber tooths, many different kinds of saber tooths and false saber tooths from a lineage that's not a cat lineage that did saber tooth independently. Uh, we have an amazing fossil record of them. Or the rest of you who are dog lovers, 
incredible fossil record of fossil dogs, including things that if you saw it today, you'd say it's a weasel until you look close enough at the anatomy and you realize it's a very primitive dog. Uh, the rhinos, for example, most people don't know this. They have an amazing sequence, mostly in North America, but then jumping back and forth to Eurasia quite frequently over the entire last 15 million years, including some spectacular animals like this creature right here. This guy is bigger than an elephant. There's an elephant there for scale. Uh, towers way above most elephants and is bigger than any large mammoth or other large elephant relative we ever know about. And it's evolved from a very small creature about the size of a Great Dane down here. But they say, oh well, where are those half-necked half giraffes? Well, yes, we have those too. Giraffes have an immense fossil record, nearly all of which are short-necked creatures, more like the okapi, which is the other live species of giraffe today. This is the modern okapi neck, this is the modern giraffe neck. And just last week, my good friend Nico Salunius described this neck which is slightly longer than a copy and not quite as long as a giraffe. So we now have an animal with a neck halfway there. Or if you like elephants and mastodons and mammoths, who doesn't? They have an amazing evolutionary story from these very pig-like things that go back about 50 million years ago. And there's the most primitive relative of elephants here, which if you looked at them, you say, oh, that's a pig, that's a hippo, to look close enough and see it's really an elephant, even though its tusks are short. And then they go through a whole spectrum of different kinds of mastodonts, and then to the biggest mastodonts, and then finally to mammoths and elephants. All the steps you would ever want to get yourself from one stage to the other. If that else. were the case, the Smithsonian National His Natural History Museum Jesus would be Christ. filled with these examples. Or how about manatees? Manatees today, of course, only have two front flippers, but here's a manatee with four walking legs. Its skull and its teeth are strictly manatee. It's even got the heavy-duty ribs they use to float and yet it's got four walking teeth. It's a walking swimming manatee, okay? Uh, one of the best evolution sequences, of course, is this evolutionary sequence of whales. Uh, for the longest time, we didn't know much at all about this, and then starting in the early 90s, we started finding more and more of these fossil whales that show this transition. So this is the earliest relatives of both hippos and some other group called anthracathids, which are now extinct. They're halfway between the whale lineage and the hippo lineage, which they look like neither one, of course, because they're not yet part of those lineages. And then working their way up through things like Ambulocetus here and all the way up to things, even a creationist would admit is a whale. All right, and I'll show you a few of these. This is Pachycetus, and then this next one here is Ambulocetus natans, literally means the walking, swimming whale. You know, the thing is about 10, 15 feet long, a big specimen. And it's known from a nearly complete skeleton, so it's not a fantasy. And then you get to things like Dalinistes, which has, still has long fingers and toes, but already is getting a whale-like body. And then they start to lose their limbs, but they still have them vestigially sticking out. Uh, so that's Rhodocetus, which is now starting to really look like a whale, but yet still has limbs that could walk. And then Bacillosaurus, which had been known since the 1840s, but only in the last 15 years or so we have found complete skeletons with the hind limbs are still preserved, didn't have any function anymore. It's a tiny vestige hanging on this thing, which has just about lost its hind limbs. And the next time you go to a natural history museum, which has a big whale skeleton hanging out of the ceiling, right behind the rib cage, look carefully, and you should see a couple of tiny bones hanging there. That's all that's left of their hip and their thigh bone. It's just a relic of their evolutionary past. It tells you whales once walked on land, okay? It's a silent witness to their uh, evolutionary past and with no function whatsoever. Classic vestigial organ. Of course, none of this matters to creationists. You know, I can talk myself blue in the face about this stuff and never get anywhere because they only really care about one species, right? We all know who that is, right? Well, let me just show you, okay? Here's the game they're playing here. You show them one hominid fossil and show them another and you show them an ape. I say, what about all the ones in between? Show me, the, well, show me the bones, show me the carcass, show wow me the evidence of uh, the in-between stage from one species to another. So if you want to play that game of how many fossils do you need to establish that humans evolve, we've had that actually since 1924. Raymond Dart in South Africa is the founder of, the, founder of this specimen, Australopithecus africanus, the first fossil that was clearly not a member of our genus Homo, yet it was related to us. Okay, and so if that was all you needed, just one specimen, we'd have it right there. We've had it for more than 90 years. But, of course, we have many more than one specimen. Thousands and thousands of hominid fossils have been found now. Most of them now are represented by pretty good skull material. So, you know, if we were to decide this is an ape where it's a human, it's hard to do because we have almost every skull, everything in between. Okay, from the most primitive member of our lineage, which is this one here from almost 7 million years ago, Sahelanthropus chadensis, to famous Lucy skeleton, which is the, the first really complete skeleton of a hominin that we know of. To various, uh, the heavy duty things, the Paranthropus lineage, this is the black skull, which is the earliest Paranthropus, Paranthropus theopicus. This is the Olibi hominid, which is now known as uh, Paranthropus boisei, not a member of our direct lineage. This is the specimen that made Richard Leakey's reputation, Louis Leakey's son, which is one of the earliest members of our genus Homo. 
And then, of course, we've got better skeletons as we get younger. This is one of the earliest Homo erectus skeletons. It's 99% complete. It's not a modern human. It's a Homo erectus. Okay? So all this fossil evidence is there, and yet none of this matters to creationists. Right? They won't ever concede that you've got more than enough evidence to show what's going on here. Holy shit. Okay, uh, Miss Wright, I gotta say that Dr. Prothrow here has just presented a pretty comprehensive case for the existence of these intermediate fossils which you claim do not exist. Do you got anything to say before I make my final ruling? What I go back to is the evolutionists are still lacking the science to back it up. There is no evidence of evolution from going from one species to another species. Show us the evidence. Show us what's lacking. Uh, all right. It's pretty obvious here that you got some sort of disease or condition with all your senses, except possibly touch. But at the very least, your sight and hearing are apparently totally f***ed. So, uh, I'm gonna have to insist that you go visit a wide spectrum of medical specialists to get some of this straightened out, because there is something wrong here with your, uh, uh, mind and most of your senses. Dr. Prothrow, the court finds in your favor not just because your opponent here is like some kind of human mole person, but also, you know, because of all the insane amount of evidence that you presented here today. All right? I'm done. I've been Judge Judah. See you next time. And don't forget, get the f out of here. Right?